indie hacking is dead. At least that's something that my guest today, Peter Levels, once tweeted about. Of course, it's not that, but it is different now. And just how different and why it's different, that we will figure out today on The Bootstrap Founder. Peter and I chat about AI startups dealing with platform risks and why indie hacking isn't even hacking anymore and how to build audiences on Twitter in 2023. A big shout out to the sponsor of today's episode, Acquire.com. More on that later. Now, here's Peter. Peter, thanks so much for being on the show. I only have one question here. Why is indie hacking dead? Can you tell me more about that? Man, <laughs> <laughs> so I tweeted that indie hacking was dead, but my point was more like, I think, because it's like a long tweet and the first message is like, indie hacking is dead. And then the, I try to explain, but nobody reads the second lines these <laughs> yeah. days. It's like TikTok, you know, people only watch 10 <laughs> seconds. Right. Uh, so what I meant was, um, like this indie hacking started, I think like 2016, got kind of big, maybe 2014 with product hunts, because before a lot of people would uh, do the VC route of doing startups, right? Everybody knows this story. Uh, so I feel like this year it kind of like became very, became very popular and a lot of people are indie hacking. And I think also now what you see, what I see on my Twitter is that big companies, big tech companies, they follow me and they follow all the other indie makers to see what indie makers are doing. Like it's, be it's, it's become now finally on the radar of tech, you know? A lot of uh, people in San Francisco, I saw a tweet by Lewis. Uh, he's making an AI startup in San Francisco and he lives in some pods, some sleeping pods. And he said, I'm in a sleeping pod, uh, like a hostel in San Francisco for $600 per month, full of indie hackers trying to ship AI startups. Uh, and I'm like, wow, that's interesting because this is San Francisco. So this is usually the place where you raise VC and it's indie hackers. So it feels like it's a mainstream term now. Term now. And, um, that's what I mean. So it means that it's become more competitive, more saturated and more difficult because you're competing not just with a lot of indie hackers now, a lot of people are doing it, it's becoming like the standard route. Uh, you're also competing with big tech companies now. And I see this with the AI startups I do. I'm, I'm competing with companies that raised $500 million, you know, like these big AI startups. And, um, and they follow me on Twitter, you know, and they see what I'm doing. So if I launch a feature, they ask their developers to make the same feature. Um, and maybe vice versa, of course, but that's what I mean. So it's dead in a way that, um, like if remote work was called remote hacking, you know, and then COVID happened and remote work became normal, it was, it would also be dead because it's not hacking anymore. It's just normal now. So it's more like, yeah, that is exactly the difference, right? Like it used to be hacking. It used to be hacky. It used to be kind of a subculture thing. Yeah. And now it's just the way people approach entrepreneurship. It's yeah. not indie hacking, it's just indie business or indie I think entrepreneurship, so. right? I think so. And people reply to me like, ah, you're in a bubble because you're like in the indie hacker bubble. It's not mainstream at all. But I do think in startups, it's, it's very present on the radar of a lot of people. And a lot of people prefer, like, man, I have a lot of VC funded founder friends and they say their next startup is uh, preferably indie and they will do it because they're kind of, a lot of people are burned out from the VCs, you know? Yeah, well... Good. I think that's a good thing because <laughs> yeah. I, I, there's a lot of speculation happening there that maybe coupled with a, an economic recession is not the best idea. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, for, yeah. for people to put their whole life energy into well, something. That's a very that good may point. Or may not. Like the economic yeah. recession is a very good point because you want to do it more lean. So lean startup indie yeah. hacking becomes more becomes a necessity because there is no money. It's hard to get funding. Yeah, it's hard to get Series yeah, I, B funding. You know, maybe. Yeah, that's right. That was Series A or even seed funding. Yeah. Right? For, for just money has dried up in many ways and, yeah. and people are much more selective in what they fund. It's funny that you mentioned like AI startups because uh, there, there's a lot of them going on. And you recently tweeted something about um, your your own, like, recently, just a couple hours ago, yeah. tweeted about like how you, you found something that you haven't felt before with other startups that, now that you are doing AI startups. And it's kind of the lack of a moat. This is a big problem, yeah. I said the F word, but this is a big problem. It's a... Uh, Everybody talks about it, even like other AI founders, VC funded AI founders, we DM and everybody has to say problems. Retention, which is the churn is very high. Um, and defensibility, like you make something and immediately you have a lot of clones because everybody's working with the same stuff. Everybody's using GPT-4 uh, for tech stuff almost, or Llama, the Facebook LLM, but, uh, or people use Stable Diffusion for image stuff. Um, Everybody uses the same. So it's not proprietary tech. Like the stuff you do around is proprietary. Like the way you combine all the models and everything in your website. But everybody can figure this out within, I would say, if you're smart within three months, if you're less smart, maybe six months to a year. So it's very mm -hmm. difficult to make a startup, AI startup now, right? Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's that's a that's an issue. I, I guess it's 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 both a, a benefit and and the curse, right? Yeah. The curse is everybody can do it. The benefit is everybody can do it. There well, is a lot of variety, and you can build a lot of things. It's really good for customers, right? If you have a lot of people yeah. uh, making these apps, and you get uh, you get a big pressure on the price to go down, but it's difficult for business owners because if the price goes down, like this is pure economics, the profit margin goes to zero, and man, my profit margin for these AI stars is not high. Like this is this week, I've been charting it and it's like um you know with the cost of gpu it, the profit margin gets really really low very quickly so yeah i was wondering about this like i was i was looking into your your startups the whole list of them and you have several right several going on nomad list is still around remote okay is still there and then you have these two ai startups that have pretty significant mrr yes, but more I now bet yeah. they also have they they have a lot of cost compared to the other yeah, two, yeah, right? yeah that's the problem that's the big problem and Man, unless the GPU costs go down, it's a difficult business. And um, and we w- we were thinking GPU costs would go down, but then NVIDIA uh, said, like, there's a kind of bottleneck. They cannot produce enough chips. It's so popular now, AI. They cannot produce enough chips. And the stock of NVIDIA, of course, went through the roof because of this. Um, so people are fighting over GPUs. It's insane. It's like, it's because you need yeah. a GPU for, it's like a processor for people who don't know. It's like a, CPU, like a computer processor, but it's for graphics. And somehow it's, it's like very, let's not go too deep, but it's very, very useful, very fast for AI stuff. You need a GPU for AI pretty much. Otherwise it's very slow. So, and there's not enough GPUs being built. Like Nvidia makes almost all of them. So that makes the cost of these servers very high. Cause it, it's, yeah. it's great. Crazy to think about just how much platform dependency you stack there, right? You have the the processor that needs to be done, and you need those for machine learning systems that also are run by somebody else. And then there's an API that is run by a company, and you built on top of that. Yeah. So you depend on all these layers. Yeah. How do you deal with this? Because I don't think NomadList is that no, much not at all. dependent no, on not at anything. All. No, right? it's like NomadList uses API to collect data for about cities, right? So I use a lot of different sources, yeah. but it's like, it's like 100 robots that collect that scrape kind of information and some is paid APIs, but it's not dependent at all. But with, um, GPUs, man, this is a great story. Like I cannot name too many names, but for example, when, so like last year I started with Avatar's AI, Avatar AI, because I was, um, I was making interior AI because I started doing AI stuff and I was typing stuff like everybody in these prompts, like to generate images. And I found out that I could build like houses, very beautiful design houses. So I made a site called this house does not exist dot org, I think. And it generates just random houses, random design, like house porn kind of beautiful. And then I f- saw it also made very beautiful interiors. So I started making interior AI where you can generate interiors. And then I thought, what if you can upload your own home interior with image to image technology and it kind of modifies it and it worked and I made interior AI. Um, and then I tried to uh, see if I could fine tune. And fine tuning is where you take the AI model and you make it more uh, focused towards a specific goal. So, for example, you want to make interiors because stable diffusion. This image model can make any image, right? It can make uh, uh, houses, but also plants, people, anything. So you want to focus it interior and it gets better results. So I trained with interior photos and it gets better results. And then I tried training with my own photos to see what happens, and it works. And you get like these these photos of yourself in every style. And I was like, wow, this is very cool. So I tweeted it and it went viral. And then the next day I was like, ah, I need to really quickly make a startup for this. So I made Avatar AI. <laughs> yeah, and it was, right. was the first, one of the, I think the first, uh, big avatar, AI avatar startup. And then th- these big companies were following me. So they quickly, within a month, they did the same and they got way bigger because they're VC funded and they made, I think, $40 million. I think I made like maybe half a million dollars of it or $400,000. A lot within a month or something, within two months. It's insane. Um, but the funny part, what I wanted to say is that the, the service I used to do this, to do this fine tuning, uh, the cost of fine tuning was $3. And then when they saw my tweets where I was sharing my revenue, uh, that I was making so much money with this, they said, sorry, we need to increase the price to $20 per training. <laughs> and I was selling them for like $25 or $30. So for like a month, they got all the money and I couldn't switch. And they said, yeah, it's difficult. Maybe they were telling the truth. They had problems with like uh, getting GPUs also, but they increased the price and I felt kind of like scammed, you know? And so this is a good example. You're dependent on a supplier who can, when they see you're successful, they increase the price. This happens to people who have co-worker spaces too. There's a Bali co-worker space famous who was very successful, got very cheap rent. And then when they were successful after the 
one year lease, they say, ah, now it's like five times the rent, 10, years, 10 times the rent. That's what landlords do. So these dependencies are not nice. Um, so I switched now to a new provider. They're much uh, like Replicate, Replicate.com. They're very nice. They're super helpful. They don't change price. They don't increase price. They only decrease prices. Uh, it's amazing. So how do you deal with this, man? It's a real problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, if, if there's one thing that, that you can learn from this experience, it's just to think about alternatives from the start, right? If you have a service yeah. that you're building on, like you, you have to find a way to abstract it enough so you can have another service to plug into your system. There. Exactly. So you have to go one level higher. So you have to get your own uh, virtual private server with GPUs, you know? But then you need to learn to code Python and do all this stuff. And <laughs> man, and this Python is too much for me. This GPU is too difficult. So I hired an AI developer for this to help me with these models because it's just too difficult for me. I, I cannot, like Danny Postma, uh, he's my friend and he makes headshotpro.com, headshots pro or headshot pro. And he, uh, he, he, do, he did it himself first. Uh, I think now I hired more people, but he's smarter than me and he can do like Python stuff. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, I tried so much, but it's like my head's. <laughs> You know? Well, it, it's kind of one of these things that is so specific that as yeah. a you know as a as a solopreneur kind of dev that just wants to build stuff, like you don't want to dive into something that takes you three years of university to understand, right? Man, I think that's it. It would take me six months of understanding this package manager, this numpy right. pi pi. Pack. It's just too much. I and it, I cannot get it working. It's just yeah. so difficult. And yeah, I'm, it's really it's complicated. But it shows my limits. This year, I see my complete limits. I'm not so good at this stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. Did you have a hard time hiring for that? Because that's that's my experience when I founded my business and I, I kind of ran it, ran it, ran it, and I thought, ah, I can do it all, right? Like, you know, the, the solo tech kind of person. Man, clearly. Is, is, that, is that the same for you? Yeah, because I thought I could do everything until this year. I thought <laughs> no. I could... Man, I, I was like complacent and I was arrogant and I thought... Because this Nomad List Remote okay, and all these stars it just worked. I did almost everything myself except customer support and like chat moderators and stuff. Um, and I have a server guy, if the server goes on, but that was it. And I thought, ah, I can do everything myself. I can do the front end, back end, the, everything. And I could. And the sites always look a little bit clunky because I do everything myself, but that's like something you take for granted. It's just, yeah. or you, you accept and it's not so bad. Uh, but this year I was like, man, there's so many things I cannot do, like marketing. I always relied on organic marketing, organic SEO stuff. And you get, I think Danny Pasma got, made me very fresh because he's, he, man, he's an insane SEO guy. He's like insane. His whole, he makes startups just based on the keywords. Like he discovered this, um, LinkedIn headshot worked so well. That was most of the searches. So he makes this service, specifically this niche, because he was also making like avatars before. Very smart. So I learned about SEO more. I, now I'm learning about, um, TikTok marketing. Uh, so I hired a guy to help me with, uh, man, because TikTok is insane. I, I talked to one influencer. He posted about photoai.com, my uh, AI photo startup. And the um, MRR went from 12K to like 40 or 50K. It's insane. <laughs> That's it's insane, a good right? right? And it stayed that way. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it was sure. And so I also worked in it. But this shows you have a really big effect of these influence. And it's a way bigger effect than press. Like I also got a lot of press for these AI startups. And yeah. this press does almost nothing. You can put the logos on your site. But nobody links and clicks on these links. It's insane. I had Danny on the show a couple episodes ago and it was really yeah, saw, interesting. Yeah. Like his his focus on SEO, that's just something that I personally have never done. Like it's just something I, I had word of mouth marketing in my things and that was fine, but he's just yeah. diving into the data and like pulling out the things and building businesses on, on top of that. That's like domaining, right? Like finding a yeah. great domain, building a domain on top of that or a business on top of that domain name. That's just such a smart data driven approach. Really like that. And Danny too is building a team. He's building a studio, right? Yeah, He's yeah, building, yeah. building yeah. something out there. So I guess you're kind of in parallel with that, like trying to expand your, your capacity beyond yeah, yeah. just yourself. 100%. And we, sh like, we always do like tech swap because he sees my photos that suddenly look much better on Twitter, my AI <laughs> photos. And he asks me, man, what are you doing now? Yeah. And, I, and, I, and we give each other hints. So we say like, man, maybe look at this feature and try this. We, you know, um, but we're not competing because he's doing headshots and I don't want to do headshots. It's his like, niche. I'm doing more general photo studio kind of thing. Um, <laughs> Have you ever considered like yeah. actually working together, like building a business together? Yeah, that's no. That's I think just... we both would, because I think we. I think I respect him a lot. He respects me a lot. Um, I think it could in the future. The man, the problem is technology, because my code. He doesn't trust my code because it's all <laughs> PHP, like scrappy PHP, <laughs> and he writes, I think, proper like JavaScript. You know. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> but in general, like, man, most of the code is Python in the background anyway. Like, that's where the real stuff happens. It's just front end. So I think it could happen in the future. I think it will be fun, for example, to, if I ever sell, to try sell, like, together or something. It would be good because it's something like that. But I have a lot of respect and I think it's very cool what he's doing. And he shaked me up a lot because he showed me that, um, cause first I was making more money with avatars. And then I think at some point he was making more money with these profile pictures and then headshots and stuff. And I was like, damn. And I was like, what's going on? Like, I don't like this, you know, cause you, you want to win, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then it was very good for me. It was good. Like, okay, you need to do a lot of stuff like SEO, like marketing, like, um, look at what keywords people are searching, make sub pages, all the stuff I wasn't doing. And, uh, yeah, it's very cool. Yeah. yeah, sounds sounds like you have a little mastermind group going on there with Danny, right? It's, uh, yeah, well, every man, not every day, but like once every few weeks we message. Yeah, that's yeah, cool. and, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I I love I love that you just talked about your code because to to me like your PHP code and that all the the stuff around it and your use of jQuery instead of like fancy uh, frameworks and all that that has become almost a meme in the community and I, I mean this in the best yeah. sense, right? Like people people think it's really funny that somebody is still coding like it's the nineties, but also yeah. people think, oh wow, crazy! You can still do this and still be successful. I love that about how you approach technology because if I think about your tech stack, it's just PHP and a little bit of JavaScript. That's it. Yeah. Right. Do, do you do you ever consider like actually changing that up? Because you just said that. Like, if if you work with somebody else, they don't trust your code. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Like, if you yeah. ever sell your business, have you ever thought about that? Like, how complicated that might actually make selling the business? Yeah. But look, the thing with this meme is I exaggerate the meme for viral effects, right. so I make it look like my code's really bad, but it's much <laughs> better. Like, people really think it's really bad, and man, I'm not saying it's great, but it's. I, man, it's pretty good. It's like very clear now. It's highly commented. Uh, it's very, um, like I write in multiple files now, you mm -hmm. know, this index.php wow. was in the beginning, you know, I use <laughs> GitHub. Um, it's, it's pretty, there's a very str structural pattern that I made myself, like folder structure and files and like there's workers. There, there's like scheduled workers that robots that do stuff. There's app. Um, there's a data file with all the database and stuff. And it all uses like SQLite. So it's very, Structure. So I think a PHP developer can get into, and they have. Like I had developers for small things uh, come on, and it's pretty. They can find what they want to find. So it does work. But I think it's more about a meme. It's 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 more. It's not about PHP or jQuery. It's more about the point that it doesn't matter that you have these developers who work in enterprise in agencies, and there's this agency MLM. I feel like where um, <laughs> you have a you have a company that doesn't know anything about tech. They come to a web agency and they want like a website or an app and stuff. And these web agents need to sell like the best stuff. So they say we use the newest technology, like we use some big framework new, and they need to um, they use it as a sales thing. And then these developers need to update their skills to uh, use this technology. Um, and this is like a cycle, and it's a whole economy because you have this ecosystem of like frameworks now get funded, and they have evangelists and like big companies like Versal. I like Versal, but they are very that's a big example they um they, they have evangelists who make developers pr promote the stuff all the time and they work for them that's the whole thing and they're vc funded and they need growth and all good but this makes new developers think that they need all this technology to make stuff and in, this technology is nice but in many ways a lot of the new technology is uh makes things more complicated often and there's a thing called i think taleb nasim taleb always talks about lindy effect where old technology um, is proven because it just works, because it's old, right? Like PHP is very old, it just works. New technology you need to be a little bit distrustful of because it's often breaks. Like, man, I have this when you buy like smart home stuff, like I go into Airbnb and there's some some smart TV or something, you know? And it's so difficult to watch TV now. And this is kind of Lindy effect. Like an old TV just works. It shows you TV and it's tested, you know? Yeah. So I think that's my whole point of this. Like, it doesn't matter what you use. There's no need for this cultism with developers. Um, if you are an entrepreneur, you know, it's all about like, if you're a developer for AZ, sure, but if you're an entrepreneur, and the problem is a lot of these developers that work as freelancers, they want to be an entrepreneur. So they bring this whole bagage, this baggage of having to use this stack and over engineering and wow, this code is so uh, elegant and stuff to uh, uh, something where the priority should be getting customers and getting people yeah. to pay money. Because then you survive, you know, you pay your rent. 
yeah, developers, and, and I think we both kind of are developers, right? We're so tool focused. We so we look at the things and we want it to be yeah. optimal. We want it to be the best thing for that solution. I'm kind of glad that you're showing that you can just stick to one tool and just make it happen, right? There, yeah. there probably is some framework out there that is like 2.7% faster in some regard, but it doesn't matter, right? If you're yeah, fast yeah, enough yeah. to bring a thing to market, that's when you monetize, not when you use the best tool possible. And I think exactly. you talked about this in the beginning too. It's like, or that's kind of the tweet that I was referring to when you were talking about uh, having to deal with the lack of moat and uh, just as an AI startup, right? When you um, you, you kind of have to de- uh, imagine that the competitor is just a couple months around the corner. Like your execution speed is so much more important than the request Man, speed of the, the web framework that you use, right? Yeah, 100%. And Man, most developers are pretty slow, to be honest. Like, <laughs> man, I'm not a good developer, but I'm really fast. You know, that's one skill I have. I, because I don't make things too complicated. Man, I repeat myself all the time. And then if I repeat myself 10 times, like, you know, don't repeat yourself is the mantra, then I write a function. But I don't, people, like, people try immediately write a function for something you repeat twice. It's like, man, just tweet, repeat it twice, you know, like this kind of stuff. And, I think especially in the beginning when you make a startup, when you make something new, it's very important to not obsess over this because you're trying to validate something. You're trying to, you have an idea, right? Like I want to have this avatar AI ID. And this was, man, it wasn't even code. It was just a a, index.html actually. It was just a page with examples of the avatars you could generate and the input photos and then a link to Typeform. No, Stripe checkout, Stripe payment link. That was it. Went to get your avatars, Stripe payment link. And there was nothing else. And then I would go to Stripe and check the email. And on Stripe checkout, I had the link after payments is a type form. So they went to a type form where it collected all the photos with file uploads. And then I would manually, so I immediately had like 100 orders. So manually, I did, I think, these 100 or 200 orders myself. So I would download the photos. And then I would go to this, this uh, platform to do this fine tuning. And I would upload their photos. And then I would download the resulting photos. Man, it was horrible work, manual work. I'd spend like all night just doing this. And then I, started automating it the second day. And after a week, it was a lot of work. After a week, it finally was automatic. Wow. So that's an example where you there wasn't even code. It was just a, a landing page and a tweet. That's so and a cool. Stripe payment link. Just that's to, awesome. And then if, when it works, you can make the code, you know? Right. Yeah, you have a process that you can actually implement, right? You have steps that you can then automate. Yeah, because you proved that it worked, that there's a business maybe, and then you can invest the time to code something. But coding takes a lot of time. There's this, um, you know the cartoon, the SXCD or something? XC- <laughs> XKCD, yeah, with, yeah, the, yeah. with the matrix? They have this cart- yeah, they, no, they have this cartoon, like uh, how much, there's a chart, like how much time it takes to automate something and how much time the thing itself takes. And often, the time it takes to automate something is higher than the time the thing takes. So if that's true, just do it yourself manually until, you know, obviously if you spend all night uploading, downloading photos, it takes too much time. You can automate it faster, right? So. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, if, if that was one night's work, and how much did you charge per per photo at that $30, point? $30, I think. That's, that's, you know, that's like, that's $3,000 for a night's work. That's not too bad, right? Yeah, it was like three <laughs> to 6000 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I yeah, mean, some great. people would do that for life if they could. Just yeah. saying. But, uh, you know, it's it's still pretty cool to uh, to do this. I, I I really, really enjoy that this particular way of doing this, like particularly with AI, right? A, a tool that's probably hard to automate when there is a lot of manual figuring things out, right, as as well yeah. with the whole um, tuning, fine tuning kind of stuff. So it's really cool that you did this for a day or a week until you yeah. had it all figured out. I, I think that's that's an indie hacking approach, the the kind of what Paul Graham calls the concierge approach, right? The the idea of doing stuff with the white glove treatment. I do this for you instead of yeah. having everything automated. A lot of people want to build software from day one. They want to build yeah. uh, a tool. They want login. They want a Stripe integration. They want all kinds of things, and then they want to make money. But yeah. you made money by just doing the thing, which is really, really yeah, interesting. Yeah, but I think it's also because I did it so much wrong. I did it, I spent right. like, a, man, I talked so much about it. I spent like a year on some YouTube analytics startup in like 2013, 14 or something, 13, I think. And, and it, nobody paid for it. Nobody wanted to be a customer. And it was just, everything was amazing. Interface was amazing, but nobody, you know, so <laughs> oh, I'm man. so traumatized by this. Like, it's just... I'm not going to build anything until there's customers, you know, like <laughs> generally. Whenever I go to Product Hunt and I see all these tools there, you know, you have the top five that are really interesting. And yeah. then you have a couple more that have, you know, a few upvotes. And then you have the 400 things that are launched that day that have no upvotes between 
all these 400 behind every single one of them is a is a developer who spent six months building the perfect product. Man, that's exactly. what I always think about. It's so and sad. And it's like it's so sad. And like they all look really good. Like the landing page look beautiful. Yeah. Like beautiful design is like a red flag for me. You know, mm. these beautiful gradients and these li- now you have these borders that move. Like yeah, it's fancy. <laughs> it's so fancy. If it's too fancy, it means you spend too much time on design, or you it's some VC starter that spent too much money on designers. If it's the beginning, if it's not validated yet, you know, and I prefer a very ugly web page in the beginning that just, uh, cause man, look at Google, look at the beginning, it was very ugly. Look at Facebook, the first page was very ugly. You need to have a very ugly, basic beginning page, I think, to validate something first. Yeah, that's that's kind of also what the whole discussion about indie hacking being dead or different. I think different is just a better phrase, right? It's not it's not dead. It's still there, but it's not the same as it, what it used to be like seven years ago, right? Seven yeah. years ago, it was a movement. Today, it's just how things are done. It's a, it it yeah. has arrived, right? It's kind of what it is. But I think that's what indie hacking is also doing. And I, I think like D- Danny posted about this, like indie hacking is the new drop shipping. That's what he kind of called it. Or there were people then in the replies to your tweet saying, well, yeah, people have just higher expectations of products now. So indie hacking now looks different and all that. Also, and I think yeah. that's important too, right? Like for us hackers, we can deal with a, you know, with a really shitty page that has like, barely yeah, any right. CSS in there, no automation. You know yeah. exactly that there is a manual component. Doesn't matter. You still want to use it because you're an early adopter. But with indie hacking going into mainstream, I think you cross the chasm as well. And you now have all these these normal people, let's just call them that, yeah, yeah, yeah. that want products that are kind of proven, that have that need social proof already. And you do yeah. this pretty well because you are your own social proof. Like your, your history of products and your building in public, like whatever you launch, you have social proof already, right? Like uh, that, that's, that's something that stands out particularly in your case that now that you're reaching like 340,000 followers on Twitter, uh, you, you bring this with you. But how would you, if somebody were to start indie hacking today, what would you tell them to get to this point? Like, what would you tell them to, to have the, the social proof that they need to launch products? Man, honestly, look, this is like very controversial. I think you should always do the opposite everybody else is doing. So now if indie hacking is mainstream, you should probably like do something completely different. You know what I mean? Like you should go where nobody is going. Cause yeah. when I started, man, it was almost nobody. It was only Patio 11. Patrick McKenzie was bootstrapping startups and everybody else was raising VC. It was, it was not normal to bootstrap startups. It was very, very, very not normal. And now it's normal. So I don't know. I always feel you need to, run away from the herd, you know, the sheep, you need to go somewhere else where no, like look for the part of the grass where nobody is and go there. If you believe in this, you know, and then spend a lot of time, spend years on this. Um, but about social proof, I don't know. I think maybe it's not important. Maybe it's just, it, it's, it's important that you make something that's like um, a problem that's out there. Like, you know, look at all the subreddits. There's a lot of problems there. Like every subreddit has like a goal and you can go see this app or startups you can make around that. Um, like somebody, there's this meme about Craigslist, right? Every category has become a startup. You can do the same with subreddits. Okay, now maybe the, the Reddit of the day is TikTok, right? Go to TikTok, see what's going on on TikTok and see what people want and make startups around there. Um, maybe that's the answer. Start doing TikToks. I tell everybody this for a year. I don't even do it myself a lot myself, but I'd shoot. But do, uh, go to TikTok and see what's going on there. And, um, Document your journey, not on Twitter maybe, but on TikTok. And so, hey, I'm Peter. Uh, I'm just starting out. I want to make a startup. I want to make some money and pay my rent. And uh, every day I'm going to make a video about this and what I'm doing and this new feature. That would be how I would approach it in 2023. Yeah. I wouldn't probably be on Twitter X at all. You know? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, that definitely a building in public where those people that you want to serve actually are. Right. And that's if, if this, yeah. uh, and then that, that is something that I really wanted to ask you because we, we talked a lot about AI startups and that kind of stuff. And it feels to me that the, the demographic for them is a younger crowd. Right. And then uh, like people who they, they have no problem with AI. Like, I, I don't know Man. if you, you've seen the same, but in our community, a lot of people are very afraid of AI. Right. So that there yeah. seems to be a generational divide there and saying TikTok is the new place to do this in front of people who are willing to accept that this is the way to go probably a good idea what do you think about this whole and like ai is is the end of humanity kind of conversation what's your stance? well first of all this generation thing is 100 right like gen z doesn't care they just use it like gen mm-hmm. man I, I work now with um 
I know the guy from Gen AI, David Park, I think, and he uh, uses TikTok and all these students use this app, Gen AI, and I think it writes papers for you or it helps you with writing papers. And everybody uses this, it's like 150K MRR, it's insane. Man, they, nobody, you're right, nobody says like, is this good or bad? Mm-hmm. Man, this, is this good or bad thing comes, from, I think, from millennials. Like, we're millennials, right? Yeah. Um, and journalists who are also millennials and people that want to, you know, maybe it's our culture to, like, challenge everything, which is kind of good and make a, make a problem out of everything. And there is, of course, fundamental philosophical things you can talk about, but I don't think it's very useful to constantly complain in every reply, you know, about the problems with AI and how it's going to destroy humanity. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think look at, the, look at the good sides and look how it can benefit everybody. Um, of course, our great leader, Elon Musk, you know, is also complaining about AI, <laughs> right? He's like, it's going to be the end of humanity. So what am I saying, you know? Um, but he's but, also like from a much older generation, right? <laughs> yeah, you're right, like... you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> No, but they, of course there's there's risk. But man, I I get kind of tired of this whole like negative um, scene on Twitter that started like 2016, and I feel died off like when Elon Musk bought Twitter. And it's a very politically engaged scene, and they're very like angry. And I don't see them a lot anymore. I think they moved to Mastodon. But there's this new scene on Twitter. I don't know if you saw it. E slash ACC. Like it's like um, about acceleration. It's like people who are kind of philosophical and they also want to, they are positive about the future of humanity and how technology can use, how we can use technology to make the future of humanity better. And it's E slash ACC and people have this in their nickname and I follow a few people like Beth Jazels. It's like Jeff Bezos, but it's Beth Jazels. He's like the leader or something. It's a very interesting group of people, very positive. And I feel that's, man, I think positivity generally works better, you know. I mean, I say this after complaining about Sony headphones mm-hmm. for three days straight, but, <laughs> but, uh, pos- no, but I still believe in the future of Sony headphones if they fix some stuff. But I think positivity works better, um, than complaining. I feel, okay, let's be honest. I think there's some powerlessness if you cannot code and you see this AI stuff happening and you're not making money with it and, uh, your income is not increasing because in- incomes are stagnant now and the government is not providing basic income, which is like free money for people because technology is replacing a lot of stuff. I understand completely. Uh, that you feel that you feel bad about this, and you're gonna complain. Like people complain about foreigners in um, in Portugal, you know, or people complain about AI, uh, you know, with, in journalism or the writer strike in America, right? It's a big thing. Like they they the people who write the TV shows and the movies, they are on strike all the time because they think GPT-4 will replace them. Man, maybe it will. So I understand the the problem. Um, as always, I think the government should provide basic income to most people, and I think. I don't know if there will be a lot of new jobs created. Actually, I, I generally people believe in that. I don't really believe in that. It's a, it's a, it's a whole philosophical or societal conversation about like, should we even want everybody to have to work to feel that they are participating in society? Right. That's that's yeah. a, that's a thing. Like the whole um, like full employment of a country is that even something we need as humans, or could we just? Live I don't a think life so. I don't of, think so, of, to be honest. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. And I think I'm, I'm a big Star Trek fan. I've always been a very optimistic sci-fi future kind of person. But just recently, I watched the Terminator movies because for some reason, I, I needed to to go back to the 80s and 90s and watch <laughs> some some really, really interesting movies. And I honestly, I, I do understand that the fear in the 80s and 90s of what technology is going to do, which is what Terminator is all about, right? What if AI yeah. computers take over? Um, that fear is very present in those movies. And I think if you're so Socialized with this, if this is how you approach a technology, then everything you look at is potentially something that destroys everything around you, right? So the fear yeah. it just destroys society, that destroys your habitat and all that. And we do see some of this, right? That what you just said is yeah. extremely wonderfully phrased. Like the people who are not able to code, who are not able to control the machine, they are afraid of the machine. That is that is very yeah, and very we bad. and we are on like podcasts. We have AI stars. We're like, wow, it's so good. Because yeah. <laughs> make money with it, you know. It's right. so of course, I'm positive yeah. about it. Yeah. No, 100 percent agree. Um, but I feel like, as always, I feel people shouldn't blame the scapegoat. Like um, uh, the technology can be very. Every technology has the same amount of bad and good it brings, you know. Uh, and AI too, internet too, right? It brought a lot of scams and man, people died, you know, because internet and and people were born because of internet. So it's both. AI is the same thing and. 
But I think governments should somehow, um, and governments are not so efficient, you know, in general. <laughs> but uh, they should, they should. I think again, they should provide basic income. And um, I think people can do voluntary work, for example. There's a lot of social stuff that has to be done. Like people need to, kids need to be raised in more like communities. I feel like um, there's a lot of stuff that uh, can be voluntary work and. Even, or paid work too, right? Like just having a basic paid work income too, yeah. doesn't, doesn't mean that people don't make money from work. It just means that True. they don't have to work to survive. That's the only yeah, difference, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think the technology, it should be protected. People should be protected so the technology doesn't destroy their income, yeah. the basic yeah. you know, level of like having a nice house, uh, being able to just buy nice good food and, and live and live a ba I think live a good life should be the goal for everybody in, in humanity and yeah. but i'm dutch you know i'm a little bit socialist i'm also a little bit socialist because i'm from east germany man i'm like socialist man, by birth. Komi. <laughs> communist. that's exactly what it is but yeah i i, I do see a, a need for this i i see a need for people feeling safe from this kind of technology because they have no no agency over making it work for them right it it, it works at them it doesn't work for them it kind of it, it's attacking them aggressing them in a way and in a, in a funny way this kind of fear of not knowing what's going to happen with the technology, it also exists for us as founders, right? As entrepreneurs, you, it's what you said, uh, this tweet of yours from earlier, I'm just going to get back to it and back to it. Like it, there is, there is no, no way for us to protect our, our technology because it's not our technology to protect. Like we only build on top of these things. So is building an AI startup something you would suggest to somebody who just is starting out as an indie hacker? Man, it's so difficult question, right? Mm -hmm. You're right. Um, I think so. I think you should, you should always try stuff with technology because you can combine technology in new ways, in unique ways that work for you. Um, I think you should always try, like try. Like you could always say that you're always too late with everything, right? You're always too late. Like people said in 2013, 14, I'm too late to do startups now because already Dropbox, Airbnb became big and it's too late now. Of course it's not too late. It's never too late. You should just start. And you never know what's next. Like now it's AI. Uh, there'll be always something next. And uh, j jump a jump a wave, but um, man, but this is the reason last year when this AI stuff started booming, like around, like I think GPT, Chat GPT launched and then Stable Diffusion launched or vice versa in the same month. And it's suddenly people are like, oh shit, this really works now. And then I started like scrambling. I'm like, man, now is the time to build a lot of stuff and see what sticks. Because if I, if I wait six months, it's, I'm not gonna, you know, it's not gonna stick. Like everybody already did everything. So I spent insane time making a lot of stuff to just catch this wave. Now we're like, what, one half, one year's in, one half years in or something. I mean, when you're in, and um, now it's quite late in that sense, but it's never too late, right? Yeah. But I think yeah. you have some kind of, first mover advantage doesn't always work, but you have some kind of advantage if you, if you catch a wave, you know, a new technological wave. Because people want to use the technology and the technology is always very, um, brutal like it's very hard to use for people so if you add a front end to a new technology you can start using it i mean nomadism was the same people were already nomading but it was very hard to find out uh where to go what the internet was what the these basic things was all separated on different blogs blog posts like oh you should come to thailand no you should come to mexico it was like travel bloggers so collecting all that together made it um you know f user friendly to go no to become a nomad it's the same thing. So you catch a wave, make technology easier to use. Do you money. still in invest a lot of time in your old businesses? You know, the, the ones that are pre-AI? Yeah, Nomad is still a lot. Like, uh, I'm improving it like every every week. And uh, I think soon, once the, all the AI stuff is kind of all the stuff I wanted to do still on my to-do list with AI stuff uh, is finished, I will probably go back to Nomad list and make it uh make improve it like i've been working on uh 3d globe like for nomad list mm. for the last two months yeah. like because this globe was a map before and now it's like this 3d globe with like lines of like i went to uh, thailand and then to qatar and then holland and then uh, brazil for example and that kind of stuff so i that that's my most favorite project i think in terms of like i feel it's really like my baby and it's you can you can work on this project forever like i said just that you can work on this until you're 80 because there's always a different way to figure out what's the best place to live. Like for you personally, it's such a difficult problem. It's so, you know, 
Yeah, it's, it's funny how this this reminds me of what you said earlier with the Lindy effect, right? Things that have been around for a long time, they will be around for an equally long time. It's kind yeah. of what that means to me. Nomad List is something like this too. You've been doing this for a while and it's still around and you're still improving it and it's still finding customers. That's fairly interesting, particularly... It's very stable. Co- contrasted against your AI startups that are like up and down and super expensive yeah. and complicated yeah. platform risk. In, an interesting lesson to be drawn from that, I think, right? The, yeah. the long-term kind of... Yeah, I never expected to stay so long. It's like nine years now. And I, I, I always expected... Because I had a YouTube channel before, electronic music mixes, and they went up really fast, like 8K per month, and then it went down also very fast. So I thought every business is like probably hype. So you, I was always traumatized, like, okay, this is just for... One or two years, need to make a lot of money, but it keeps it keeps going and it makes man it averages usually like forty or fifty or sixty k per month, uh, a lot of money. So just nomad list, so not a lot of costs. So it's a very nice business. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it definitely sounds calmer, right? Like l- less less man. crazy than the AI startups. Man, yeah, I tweet about it today. Like this AI stuff is so stressful because you you always need to stay ahead of the game and of competitors. And when a new technology comes out, like now it's a little bit slower, but last year, every week there was some new thing, new breakthrough, and you need to implement this very fast. And um, it's it's stressful for sure. Like it's, it fucks with your sleep, you know, like yeah, this stuff. You need would you sell them? Would you, would you sell yeah, the AI businesses? Yeah, I think, I, I think I'll, I'll get it to a certain level, like maybe 100K MRR for photo AI and interior. And then like... Um, I got them valued recently, and the multiples for AI stars are very good. Like they're very, they're quite high. Like um, normally for like these indie stars, you get like two, three X or something, right? For AI, it can be like five or six or even eight, because it's kind of hype now. So I think um, again, the problem is profit. Like the multiples are based on profit. Yeah. So you need to make, you need to cut these costs rapidly, and then you need to go to a broker, and then you need to sell for like good, good amount of money. Uh, but it, man, it's, I don't know, it's hard to sell. It's always like a nice challenge, this AI stuff. And, but it is stressful, you know? Probably gives you heart disease. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, if, if not, like, and it, mental health issues, right? With anxiety and, and dealing with, like, all these unforeseen changes in the, the platforms, like the dependency on, op- on, on open AI and all their platforms, right? If they decided to do the Elon Musk $42,000 a month kind of move, I mean, yeah. you could probably handle it maybe, but you know, like that, yeah. it, it would be such a, such a bastard move <laughs> really to pull yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the good thing with AI is it's very open. So when one, com- when one company will raise the prices very fast, you can probably easily, back then not really, but now you can easily switch to another provider. There's so many providers now. So you, there's no, there's less platform dependency now than a year ago, you know? Because there's a lot of API providers now. But, um, uh, yeah, but it is stressful, you know? But I go gym, I go deadlift and, you know, over press and squats. And then it's good for my mind. I don't have anxiety a lot. And, uh, but still, it's stressful. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, that's that's the thing with with these kind of hype startups, right? You really have to push, and then you have to yeah. make as much as you can, and then go to the next thing. And that feels it doesn't feel yeah, like very sustainable. It's not my vibe, you know. Yeah. I, I like building long term businesses, and that's what I had with these avatars. It felt so kitschy to me, so gimmicky. Like it's <laughs> yeah. not really my vibe. Like yeah. it's kind of like too, uh, uh, it's too short term, you know. And this photo guy feels more like a photo studio. For long term, like it can have potentially long term, but how? Who knows? Because AI, you don't know how long. But the intention is to have a long term uh, product. It can stay, even if you sell, it can stay for like five years or ten years. You know, because the philosophy is that you can have photography without needing a camera. You know, like you can just train yourself, and then you can make unlimited AI photos anywhere in the world from your computer. You know, you're on the beach, or you're in the office, you're anywhere. Such you know, such so. an interesting way of of thinking about photography. Like, yeah, it, it completely removes the the act of photography. Man, the act is gone. Right? Right. <laughs> you just, don't need to go anywhere anymore. Just the if result. It works. Yeah, it, it, it's it's such a such a cool idea, and I, I kind of love that. It's like you and and I kind of also hate it, like f- from a sense yeah. of somebody who likes to take photos. Right? It's 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 a weird. I'm torn on on both sides, and I love the fact that it makes money. I I hate the fact that um it's so easy to build, so everybody builds it. it it's but just, man, it's, it's so like Photoshop. Photoshop had the same. When I was a kid, Photoshop came out, and had to, the newspapers are full of Photoshop. Like this is yeah. gonna destroy photography. Everything's <laughs> fake now, and it didn't. Like all it did was that people use it for uh, touching up or for art and stuff. Um, 
so it's become a tool and i feel it's, with all this stuff it's, be, it's becomes a tool for like imagine you have a wedding photographer he makes a lot of photos and then there's not a single good one okay maybe you can use ai to train this person and you yes. can make some renders and then stitch them back into the photo yeah. you know yes. like that that is really cool that makes that, sense that can be it can be it can be a mix of reality and ai you know like that's probably the the future so that, that's uh, i that I, I was gonna ask you what you think of ai being the future but i kind of hear the sentiment of ai as tools that make actual things easier that is always yeah. going to be the future right it's not that the ai is going to do everything for us ai yeah. is going to help us do the things better that's how i see it at least yeah I see it. but i do think it replaces people like i do think it can replace oh, sure. uh photographers so it's like it is a tool but you'll probably need one photographer instead of 10 photographers you know you need one person who can control the ai so so but yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting. Uh, but also for interior designers, like interiorai.com, it, it tries to, a lot of people, interior designers use it for ideation. So you have a client who wants to get an idea of a, like, because clients don't know what they want. So you take a photo of their interior and then you give them a lot of different styles. And look, do you want this? And you can kind of move through ideation together to find the style that the customer wants and uh, make them, show them how it looks. And um, But this also removes a lot of jobs again because you you need less like uh like I, I was looking at real estate agents a lot of them use already people who make these renders especially new construction they use beautiful interior renders it's all fake and this easily you can do with ai in man it takes 10 seconds to render of a, a whole beautiful render normally it takes what like two days for people to make this so that's a real thing but these people can use these tools also it's going to shortcut a lot of uh processes that are established already and have like people working on them uh, but that, yeah. that's that's like you said photoshop is that too right there used to be other tools to like manipulate images before and it used to be like a more physical it's like editing editing video right people used used to actually cut like physically yeah. cut the stuff yeah, my dad and, did and that it got yeah, digitized and all of a sudden you, you do in in a second what took hours to get done right exactly yeah, now you can edit on your iPhone, you know, like yeah. my dad is a big, he's a, his favorite thing is film editing. Yeah. And he did this with, he has classic film tapes and he cut and glues everything before. Yeah. And then he had this video set up with prof professional video, like Batacom and stuff. And now it's like Final Cut Pro. But then I'm like, look at my iPhone. Like I make videos with my yeah. iPhone now in, in yeah. TikTok. You can just edit even faster and it is high quality. So, uh, you know, it's, it's all changing fast and. Yeah, it will keep changing, and AI is part of that. So yeah, I find it so interesting that you you have you get to see both sides. You get the the boring project. Let's just, I'm not gonna call Nomadless boring, but it kind of yeah. is. Like in terms yeah. of the you know the hype around it, it's just used by the people that need it, and that's it. Yeah, and you get the the hypeish projects that that get headlines, that get like uh, coverage in the press and that kind of stuff. Yeah, but this was Nomadless before, of course. Like yeah. nine years ago, Nomadless was what got a lot of like. It was in New York Times, it was in all these articles. It was like, oh my god, deal Nomads gonna go everywhere. So it was hype, and then it, the hype ends. It becomes normal, it becomes mainstream. Do you think like being a nomad is still something? Like obviously, I, I see you traveling around the world. My question is not like it's still around. Obviously, no, no nomadism isn't dead, right? <laughs> but uh, is, yeah. is it still something that you personally do? Do you want to do this forever? It's same like with your business. Do you want to keep being a, an indie hacker forever? Do you still want to travel? No, all the time? so uh, man, mo like this is the problem with this idea of digital nomads. Like most of them are slow mads and they start out very fast. They go like, you know, sometimes week to week to different places, like kind of like backpacking. Then it becomes month to month and then it becomes like three months usually or six months in one place. And I feel, uh, and I also slowed down a lot. Like with COVID, I just stopped. Everybody stopped yep. traveling, right? Right. This year was kind of crazy with travel, but before I was, you know, I tried to like keep it to like two countries. And I think for mental health also, like I think you do go crazy if you keep traveling so much. I personally do. I did, you know. Um because you don't know where you are anymore. Like you literally, there was literally a thing with nomads. You wake up and there's a thing like they don't know, like, where am I? And you look outside. Oh, okay. I'm in <laughs> Croatia or, you know, this stuff. Yeah. Man, it's probably not so good, but it's very interesting <laughs> lifestyle. But I think long term, like, man, if you have a relationship and, um, if you have kids later, all this stuff, I still think you can move, but you probably want to limit to a few places, you know? And I think. We just become the same as what people like retirees do. They are like, um, like in America, right? They're, what are they called? Like birds, like winter birds or something like they, S in the winter they go, snowbirds. In the winter they go to Florida and in the summer they go to New York or something. 
this is the setup. So it's just, it's go, gonna go to the same thing. And I, I do this already. Like uh, in Europe, in the South, it gets cold in the winter. I try to go to Asia, Southeast Asia, where it's warm. Um, I try to mix like the big city Asia with you know, small village uh, Southern Europe on the beach. Uh, I think this works for me. But of course, personal works here. But uh, yeah, nomadism is very still very active and lively. And there's real like spots like Bali is still a very big spot in Thailand also and Mexico with the Americas now coming in because they can work remotely. A lot of them are by default nomads and they live in Mexico. Um, but yeah, are nomads a lot of, nomading a lot? Probably less, you know, it's the, but a lot of people are living in not their original countries now because yeah. of remote work. And it's right. kind of called digital nomading, right? I guess. Yeah, in, in yeah. a way, anybody working from a computer is a digital nomad, like no matter if well, it's in a, their in another country, like in yeah, another country yes. in their home country, and that's become very normal. So I think it's still like uh I think man, I think it's still a very cool lifestyle. Like if I'm if I was twenty, I would not go probably to university anymore. I would just go travel with my laptop and try little startups and stuff. And it's such a travel is such a Especially solo travel, you you have to survive. You have to meet people. Like so, if you everybody has social anxiety these days, so you have to go out there and, and talk to people, and you learn how to talk to strangers. And you know, I was very probably shy before. And now I'm not because I I learned how to talk to people, learned to go out of my room, and you know, and survive. And I think this stuff you learn from travel. And every city you go, you can be a new personality. You can test your personalities. You know. Yeah, sounds a little psychopathic, nice. but it's yeah, no, yeah, you, you know your AB hometown, your <laughs> AB test, yeah. But you know your hometown, you're you're this this certain Arvid, but then you go yeah. out of your country, you you become international Arvid. You're you're like very different, and you try this, you know, you try to be very extrovert, and you can. A lot of people test this, and I think that's very cool benefit of uh, nomading. And <laughs> that sounds yeah. awesome, and it also sounds like it kind of sounds like Twitter to me, where it can also be the person that you want to be, right? Yeah. Like you, you project like the the best parts, hopefully, or the worst parts of your personality onto social media. How do you deal with that? Like you have a pretty sizable following now, and so with with all the the changes that have been recently made to Twitter or X, as we call it, right? Yeah. There's a lot of a lot of lot of difference in in how we how we approach engagement and what gets views, what gets like retweeted, what gets actually pushed by the algorithm. How do you deal with this? Because you, you have a lot of reach. Man, so I think the algorithm has changed with Elon changing it and the team because before um, before everything would kind of get views and likes, right? It would take like a, it took a while, but everything would get like, you know, get exposure. You would, a lot of people would see your tweets anyway, whatever you yeah. wrote. And some would go viral a little bit. I think they changed it more to like where if something goes viral in the beginning, it becomes pumped maximum. So it goes like before I would get like 100 retweets. Now if something viral, it gets a thousand retweets. It goes very far. But on the other side, uh, often many tweets get like two likes. Yes. You know, and I have 300,000 followers. It's so, so it's, bizarre. I, so they, they, so weird, I think right? they test in the beginning. Once you tweet, they test. Does this tweet work or not? Do people care about it? And I think how they test it, they check how many seconds you watch the tweets. Uh, the people who, who watch your tweets, you scroll through and they, they count now the numbers, the seconds. And Elon Musk told, said this, you know. Um, and when it, this tweet doesn't perform well, they just don't show it anymore a lot. So it become more extreme. And this, of course, creates even more extreme Twitter because you get um, tweets that have to go really far, really extreme to get, you know, like dunks kind of. And then they get a lot of retweets or nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's really so, bad. I, it's 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 kind of disappointing, right? Because if you just tweet something honest, that is just, you know, something yeah. that that comes from a place that is not extreme but is still important and it yeah. gets just like kind of washed away and buried beneath all the, yeah. the outrage things. Kind of makes makes Twitter a less less enjoyable platform at least from from me. Yeah, I think so. Like product updates, they don't really like I used to always I always do product updates like I made this new feature and I they used to get like, you know, like a lot of views they get less much less now because it's not that interesting it's kind of like yeah that's kind of nice you know so the long-term kind of vibe of twitter changed a little bit but uh, i do have faith in our great leader elon musk you know <laughs> maybe he can improve it um i think it's also a survival thing like they need to get more monthly active views they need to yeah. become more like tiktok tiktok is maximum this algorithm like they check every video and they see if it works or not and then they pump it also i think he's on tiktok a lot and checking this and he wants to make Twitter very similar. And also with video, but also with text. 
uh, but then with the TikTok algorithm. So, it, you know, you have OKRs, like the metric target, which is like more uses. uses. And now I think Twitter has a uh, record use, like 500 million active users, uh, of active users. So it does work, but it changes the vibe a little bit. But I, I ignore it. I just still try to tweet whatever I think. And man, if nobody cares anymore, I'll keep tweeting. Because I was tweeting yeah. and nobody cared 10 years ago. I'll just keep <laughs> That's tweeting. That's exactly you know? right. It's about your own, you know, your own. Yeah. you should enjoy it. You shouldn't do it for the audience, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, and and the, the people who enjoy what you do, they will find you, right? Like if, if you're yeah. if you're just consistent enough, they'll go to your profile and they will read your stuff, right? Yeah, they won't right. maybe not see it in the time now, but they will go to there. So I think, yeah. man, like don't be thread boy, you know, like don't do like the five things you need, the five AI tools you need in two thousand twenty four, like yeah. bullshit. Number three will surprise you, right? Number three will shock you. Yeah, <laughs> it's bullshit. Just yeah, uh, really man, what I love. One thing interesting, he also increase these long posts. Like now you can write blog posts. Yes. These blog posts, by definition, get a lot of view time because of seconds, right? These do work really well. So it's almost like a blog platform. So, uh, man, a lot of times I just start writing blog posts now on Twitter. Yeah, I've this seen this work. too. And, and video too, right? Like any kind of yeah. medium to, to long form video that really does well. Like if, if people exactly. just keep watching a couple seconds because it's so interesting. But that's, that's the interesting thing about Twitter. Now you need to take YouTube ideas, the idea of yeah. a YouTube intro. For seconds, right? Transport it. Exactly. Like you won't get, believe what's get, next. Go. And then, <laughs> get, like Mr. Beast yeah. style. And you need thumbnails and all that stuff now yeah, on Twitter yeah. as well. If, yeah, if you yeah. want to professionalize, it just feels it's different. And maybe that's, that's the exact same sentiment as we had earlier indie hacking dead nomadism dead twitter dead we all dead kind of the old ones at least it's all yeah. new right it's it's all just different at this point yeah i feel like it's a, but you have these time schisms yes you know where a lot of things change suddenly i feel this is definitely covid of course this covid years and then maybe the effects was more 2021 2022 it's a big schism like we're in a new cycle now look at the recession also and man Honestly, these cycles are usually seven years. That's why I always say seven years cycle. You can search it on Wikipedia. Economic cycles usually seven years. Uh, what economic is it cycles, Con are cultural cycles. cycles? <laughs> I don't know. Is that yeah. the name? I think I think it has. Yeah. The name. <laughs> but also, like economic cycles are social cultural cycles too. Yeah. Like when That's there was right. a recession in two thousand eight, you would see these hipster coffee shops pop up in Amsterdam. I remember this vividly. It changed the culture to kind of scrappy and hipster and it changes fashion you know it changes everything so there's definitely big cycles and we're in a new cycle now ai is part of this new cycle right so in seven years it's all gonna go poof, again mm -hmm. and something new comes so yeah. but i think yeah again don't be angry about the changes just embrace and reinvent yourself for this new time and uh, you always need to reinvent yourself right like yeah it's yeah. a constant I think I think you're right. It is an attention economy, right? Now everybody has very limited attention because everybody's pulling at it from all sides. I, I talked to to April and Alter about this f YouTube thing too, right? Because she knows how to do a good YouTube video. It was funny. I had her on the show, and the day after that, she published a video that went viral and is now at like two hundred thousand views or something. Jesus. She knows what she's doing. It was really cool. Yeah. And uh, like I watched her video on how to do an intro to a, to a YouTube video, and the whole idea is to to make it absolutely clear what the promise is of the video what yeah. you're gonna do and then surprise people and give a bit more than they expected it's really just trying to get people to uh, to feel confident in giving you their attention for a longer time but that's like a tweet right we, we exactly write these tweets it's it like exactly. here, there's a problem i have so i thought about it and i did this and then i solved the problem here's to do it yourself you know like <laughs> it, it yeah. is a formula yeah, and and it is it's required because you need to be able to stand out amongst other people who are also interested in getting attention. Right? It's just yeah. a new way to communicate. We yeah. used to we had a time where we wrote letters all the time, and then email yeah. came along, and then social media came along, and now we have this. And this is, I guess, yeah. just how what we have to deal with. But the attention economy has always become it's always become less attention. Like you used to have long movies, and then it became yes. TV shows. And then it became YouTube videos. And now it's yeah. TikToks. Yeah. Next will be like just a two, one second two second. video or something. You know, like <laughs> I don't know, but it's it, it's always been. But it's, but now I it feel both because you have long podcasts like Joe Rogan is three hour podcast, and I listen to the whole things, and it might take me days because I listen a little bit here, and next I listen a little bit here, and I, and then you also have the clips. You have the TikTok clips of podcasts, so it works both. You have this yes. outlier, you know, like um, what do you call it? the economy. You have both sides. 
Yeah, so. that makes that makes a lot of sense. Like you, and it's kind of the you should be zigging when uh, everybody else is zagging, right? That kind of yeah. thing. Now you can do long form content for the people who really care about it, and everybody yeah. else needs the short term stuff. And even for the short form content, you can still do the clips, so you get your long form, but in short, exactly. I, that's exactly. that's. Yeah, it, the more I do like of podcasts and, and YouTube and writing and newsletter and whatever I do, I do a lot of things that, but they're all on, based on the same material. I just use different ways of distributing the same material, and maybe that yeah. is is the lesson here, right? That depending on the media, depending on the medium, like the social media platform or YouTube or whatever, you just have to shape it the right way for people to consume it. Yeah, yeah. You could, I think, you can learn a lot from these big, big, famous influencers, uh, even if you don't like them. Man, they will say like outrageous stuff. Like, I don't like this guy, but Andrew Tate, for example, uh, they, he says really radical stuff that's very controversial and too much, you know? And then the long form part is quite balanced. Like he kind of softens down. He's like, what actually what I think, man, I don't think it's very honest strategy, but I do, there's something to be learned there where, um, if you say things that are, quite packageable into shorts, like answers. That person that can package their answer in the first sentence probably well, and then go for long form, they will, this will get clipped and this person will get more views than a person who cannot make a proper sentence first yes. to summarize it, you know? Yeah. So becoming good at writing tweets and even talking now in a short sentence is becoming like a, like a integral, like, man, it can make you rich or not, right? Because if your video goes viral, you become famous and you sell products. So, man, that's like a skill, you know? Yeah. And, and, I don't and know if I'm good at it because I ramble. <laughs> <laughs> well, me too, but we're, we're, we're both trying our best, right? Yeah. At, least, at least we're trying. We're in the arena and not on the sidelines, yes, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the things you say, uh, a lot of people have opinions about. Like just, uh, you know, <laughs> you, yeah. you get a lot of trolls and you get a lot of people that turn your stuff into memes. How do you feel about that like in particular? Man, it's great. It's like, it's amazing. Like these memes are amazing. And <laughs> man, it's just, it's part, what do, you, what do you expect? Like you tweet like, you know, controversial stuff <laughs> right. to uh, a lot of people. And of course people are gonna, man, people get like, even like, you know, friends of friends, they message in chat like, man, what you tweeted now is too much for me, man. It's unacceptable. I'm unfollowing you. I, you can't do, you can't say this about this framework, you know, because I use it. People get really triggered. Man, I don't know. It's a. Uh, I think it's really funny. It's like, but you need to see it as kind of like a game, you know. Man, it sounds so psycho, psych psychopathic, sociopathic, but it's you cannot take it seriously. Like the, it, there's, it's impossible to see it as a normal conversation because we have a normal conversation. But if you have now, you add three hundred thousand people on the other side. It's just shouting. It's like lynch mob. It's so. And this changes you, I think, and you have to watch out. It doesn't change your personality in real life, you know, because you become, but it does a little bit, of course. But, um, but I think the benefits generally outweigh the negatives. So you meet a lot of cool people like you. Um, like most of my friends I met via Twitter, you know? Yeah. And, uh, we met on Twitter, uh, a lot of like, like a lot of famous people also, like people that really did really cool stuff. They DM me and they, we talk and stuff and it's like, wow, super cool. Like, um, man, I, like, uh, I talk with DJ Fresh because when I used to make music was a drum and bass music, DJ Fresh is a very important figure in, in music. He, now he makes an AI startup too called voice-swap.ai. Okay. You to plug it and we DM and we talk about a lot of stuff and I'm like talking to my drum and bass idol. Yeah. You know, it's insane. It's like yeah. every time I'm, I'm still shocked. So it's a, and and I think the more you can, even if you write controversial stuff, but it's your real opinion, you get a lot of attention. And and via this, people understand it's Twitter. People people that get angry, we don't understand. It's like it's like a stage, you know. It's a show yes. kind of. Yeah, for sure. But people who are smart, they understand. Okay, this guy is on a platform and he's doing a show thing, and and you you have to take everything with a grain of salt, you know. And but I true, I, I try to say things honestly. I don't say things just to bullshit, you know. Yeah, that's. I guess if you have controversial opinions, the authentic representation is just to talk to people about those things, right? To share these yeah. opinions. 
Like you, you don't hide them. You just, you don't b become like the, the person that is like happy with every single thing or is like really, really appreciative of every opinion. You just say what you say and you yeah, try to be honest. And, and, and apparently that's like controversial, but of course it becomes <laughs> controversial because there's so many people yeah. and have to people disagree with you. So then it becomes yeah. by definition controversial, but it's not really controversial, you know? And, um, the problem is if you get scared, most people get scared of this and then they start tweeting like basic normal stuff and it's not interesting anymore. <laughs> and I think the reason a lot of people follow me is because they know I'm honest and I'm not perfect and I write whatever I think and it's usually crazy. But I also, I like, yes. yeah, but I, I like to say <laughs> opinions and then like about frameworks or something and I say something and then I like to hear what people, like when people reply, I learn from that and I change my opinions. Like I have strong opinions, weekly health. I do change my opinions all the time. And, but it's a stage. It's like a podium. It's, it's, it's a show kind of, it's, it's inevitable that it becomes a show. It's very difficult not to, make it and um you have people like like lex friedman for example uh he's very cool and he he gets a lot of hate also and he 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 chooses to uh talk more about like love like we're all connected one world and everybody loves each other and i, I like that too but it's not really my personal style my personal style is just saying what i think i want to keep being true to myself i don't want to become fake you know and not saying lex friedman is fake but he chooses like love style i choose more like what's on my in my heart is on my tongue like it's a german dutch expression i think and i put that on twitter i try to keep it in all in sync you know yeah and i don't I like, like people who are you. different offline you know yeah that, that's that and that, that's that's perfectly fine and that's why i appreciate your tweets i know that when you tweet something even if it's controversial it comes from an honest truthful place yeah. And that is the way you think about it. And that is the way you will talk about it. And I know what I get, right? That's the thing. Yeah, it's very authentically yeah. you. And I, I I think that is a really, really smart way to building an audience or whatever you might want to call it, or just have a Twitter presence or social media presence is just to not hide who you are and yeah. kind of stand behind the things you say. But it's so difficult because people are getting really angry and they hate yeah. you for your opinions. And yeah. And people, yeah, you see these breakdowns on Twitter, right? People just have a meltdown because they yeah. get so much hate. I get this every day. Yeah, me too. Yeah. I think we both follow many, many people through lists and follows. And I, I, I think over the last three days, I saw like four people saying, I'm going to need a break from Twitter. This is yeah. enough. Right. And I just, yeah. uh, it's unfortunate that when it comes to that, because people, and I, I'm the same way. Like I post something, 30 people say, this is really cool. One person says, this sucks. And I, all I focus on is this one person and not the 30 Man. other people that really Absolutely. enjoyed what I said. Right. That's typical. Like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's, re it's really bad. But hey, let's, let's end this on a high note. I yeah. think your, your Twitter account is awesome. I think you're you. you're sharing on, just you're honestly sharing things that you encounter in your daily coder entrepreneurial life, and I think that is absolutely worth sometimes getting into controversial fights with other people who have no no skin in the game whatsoever, but a lot yeah, of opinions. True. So, um, where would you like people to go to follow you if they don't already? But where, where would you like people to go to look at what you do, how you do it, and the projects that you're building? Uh, I think Twitter, but well, it's X now, you know, x.com <laughs> slash levels IO. So it's L E V E L, like level S I O, levels IO. Yeah. Nice. Thank yeah. you for having me. And I'm a big fan of your Twitter account too. Aww, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of you, man. It's, it's so nice. It's, it's taken a couple of years for us to have a chat finally, but I'm, I'm super happy that we got to talk about all of this today. I'm really, really looking forward to seeing like where your indie hacker journey, if, if that is still what you consider yourself to be, takes you in the future. And, uh, thanks for building all of these things in public. You're a role model to a lot of us. So thank you, so man. Much. It's an honor to hear, man. Very it's nice. Been, been a pleasure. Thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. And that's it for today. Peter mentioned that he'd be open to sell his AI businesses eventually. And I know just the right place for him to list those businesses. I will now briefly thank my sponsor for today, Acquire.com. Imagine this, and it's not going to be hard because Peter just talked about this the whole time. You're a founder who's built a really solid SaaS product. You acquired massive amounts of customers and you're getting consistent monthly recurring revenue. That's the SaaS dream as explained and evidenced by Peter's AI tools. The problem is you're not growing for whatever reason, maybe lack of focus, lack of skill, lack of interest, and you just feel stuck in your business and with your business. In Peter's case, it's really the unawareness of where things are gonna go, right? Is the stuff still gonna be around in a couple months? Can I still run this business by myself or should somebody take over? 
Well, the story here at this point, in many cases, is that people would love to hear that you buckled down, reignited the fire, you work on the business, not just in the business, you build an audience and you market and do sales and outreach, grow a team and whatever. Six months down the road, people would love to hear that you made all that money, right? You tripled your revenue, you've built this hyper successful business. But reality is unfortunately not as simple as this. And the situation that you might find yourself in might be very different. And every founder is facing this crossroad in a different way. But too many times, the story that follows is the same. It ends up being one of inaction and stagnation until your business itself becomes less and less valuable over time or worse, completely worthless. So if you find yourself here already or you think that your personal story is likely headed down a similar road, I would consider a third option, and that's selling your business on acquire.com. Because capitalizing on the value of your time today is a pretty smart move. It's the only time you have. Acquire.com is free to list. They've helped hundreds of founders already. So go to try.acquire.com slash Arvid and see for yourself if this is the right option for you and your business right now. Thank you so much for listening to The Boots of Founder today. You can find me on Twitter at Arvid Kahl, A-R-V-I-D-K-A-H-L. You find my books on my Twitter course there too. And if you want to support me and this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. That would be really appreciated. Just get and rate the podcast in your podcast player of choice and leave a rating and a review by going to ratethispodcast.com slash founder. It really makes a massive difference for me because if you show up there and rate and review, then the podcast will show up in other people's feeds and that just means more people get to learn from people like Peter today. Any of this will help the show. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful day and bye-bye.